The reading today is from Proverbs chapter one, verses one to seven, and I'm reading from the NIV. Proverbs chapter one, verses one to seven, the proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right. And just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of un- of knowledge, but fools despise. Wisdom and instruction. Well, thank you、uh, for tuning in and joining us this morning. <clears throat> My name is Morris. I'm one of the leaders at Christchurch. I'm going to be opening up God's Word to us today.、Uh, particular welcome to you. If you're watching and you're not really sure about Christian things, you're not sure if the Christian thing is for you, but you're just tuning in to have a look. Welcome. Or if you're、um, someone who really wanted to come to one of our in-person services but you couldn't register in time this week. Please do come、um, to the Christian Fellowship School sometime over the next few weeks, as we are beginning to meet together physically again. I am just going to pray as we begin. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this Your Word, and we pray You would teach us and train us, rebuke us, correct us, help us live with wisdom in Your world. We pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, we are in the process <clears throat> of re-entering the world. I feel like we're coming out blinking into the light after a year of this strangeness. <clears throat> As I、uh, record this, certainly the plan is that tomorrow、uh, we will be entering a new phase of being able to connect with people again. But the world we re- are re-entering, moving from self-protection to going into the world, it's a different world than the one we left, isn't it? It's a broken world. I mean, the world's always been broken, but it's even more broken than usual. People are re-entering the world, carrying difficult things, and as we go into the world like that, as we re-engage again with people all around us, with the church, with our community, with our work, I want to be someone who brings good. Who brings blessing? Who brings good stuff with me to a world that is broken and lonely and recovering from this terrible thing that's happened to us all? Well, the word the Bible uses to describe that is wisdom. A wise life is not a life that sits in thinks deep thoughts all the time. It's a life that does good in the world. That makes God's world better than it is. That brings joy and flourishing to myself and to other people. And I want to be that person as I learn to re-engage with the world for myself. And so, for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at this book of Proverbs in the Bible, which is all about that: how to live a wise life, a good life, not a good life as in self-righteous and overly moral, but a good life. As in one that brings good to the world that we live in, and the key verses、uh, we just had read to us there is verse seven: "The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom." As I've just said, wisdom is the life that brings life. You know, wise people—they're not just people who know how to live, who know the answers to tough questions. Though they often are that. Wisdom is a wider thing than that. They're the people you want to be with, not because they're witty or because they're rich or because they're popular, but they're people who behave in a way that brings good to the world and does good to you to be with. You will know people like that in your own life. And given the world's so messed up, I want to be one of those people. So that's what wisdom is. And the Bible says, the proverb says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let's think about the fear, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord isn't being scared of God in the Bible. No, it's more like this. 
it's not hard to tell usually what matters most to people. What matters most to people is usually clear. As you get to know someone, it will become clear if their house really matters to them, if what they wear is really important to them, if what they drive is really important to them, if their children or their business matters most to them. That becomes clear. It comes out in the way that you live. Well, the call of the Bible is to say to us, give that place of honour, of reverence, of most importance to God. And if you do that, you will know the way to live this life-giving life. So the beginning of wisdom is that God has that place. And that makes sense, actually, because God made the world that we live in. So the starting point for living well in this world will be to give him honour and reverence and make him the most important person in your life. You will then know how to make good life-giving decisions that fit with the world that he's made. And anything else in that place, that place of fear and honour and reverence, will provoke you to make selfish, life-taking decisions. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. It's a big ask, isn't it, to say, put someone else in the place of honour and reverence, most reverence in your life. Fear the Lord in that way. But we need to remember when we see in the Bible that word Lord in capital letters, it's God's particular name. It's not make some concept of God central in your life. It's the God we meet in the Bible. We meet through Jesus, the God who makes promises, who loves and rescues his people, who loves us with an everlasting love. And so the call to fear him, to honour him above all things, is the call to love what is most worthy of love, to give the central place to the only one who is guaranteed to be for us and to care for us. It's to put in the place of honour the one who gave his son so that we could be on his side. So we, we fear, it's not just the fear of God, it's the fear of the Lord, putting that Lord who loves us in the most central place is the beginning of wisdom. Whatever you make most important will shape you. If you make your job the most important thing in your life, that will affect the way you treat people. If you make your children the most important thing in your life, that's the way will affect the choices that you make. And if you make this fountain of love and goodness and care and relationship the centre of your life, that will affect you so that you become this wise person bringing life to others. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and it's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and also the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Just knowing God, just worshipping him, that's not all there is. God makes us to know him, yes, but he also created this whole world for us to explore and to know about and to learn and to build in. And we grow more in wisdom as we walk through the world fearing God. He doesn't want us just to gather around and sing songs of worship to him all the time. He wants us to go out into the world with him as a companion and learn about the world that he's made. Wonderful way to think about life as a Christian is that every day is going to be an adventure where you walk through this world holding hands with the one who made this world and so learning about him more and more and how to live as you see the things he's made. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You could say, honouring the God who guarantees his love for you is the foundation for a life-giving life. Honouring the God who guarantees his love for you is the foundation of a life-giving life. You know, last week we were looking at the book of Acts and we discovered that when the, the first church lived in the fear of the Lord, God added to their number. And I think some of us think, great, well, what does it actually mean day to day, though, to live in the fear of the Lord? Well, Proverbs is all about that. 
about saying if you have this right attitude to God day to day, what does it look like? And the book is full of short little sentences that we think about. Short little sentences about things like ants and dogs and beetles and grass and wives and husbands and children and gossip and education and money. And the book invites us to walk through the world with Solomon as he fears God and see what we learn about life. It's very practical. And over the next three weeks, we're going to look at three things, three areas that Proverbs talks to, to help us as we emerge into the world to be people who live life-giving lives. So, first one this week is about words. And I'm going to say two things. The first one much longer than the second. First thing is this, the proverb says, words have power, so speak carefully. You will know the power of words. Things that people have said to you have really affected your life. You will have had bad experiences of things people saying that are burned into your memory and good things people said to you have lifted you. Things you've read or seen have changed your view of the world. Words have power. I can still remember the way I felt when my head teacher came into my primary school classroom when I was nine and made me stand up in front of everybody and said, we did tests and you did not do as well as you should have done. I would have expected better from you. I still remember the way it felt, those words, all they were were words, but they had power. And Proverbs acknowledges that. Look at this verse. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. See what he's saying? Words are powerful. They can kill or bring life. And those who love to talk or who depend heavily on hearing from other people will be affected by the tongue. We will eat its fruit. There's no way of escaping that. God uses words to change us. That's why I'm giving a sermon now. That's why we have readings from the Bible. Speaking, language, is a world-changing thing. So Proverbs says, As you walk through the world in the fear of the Lord, you should treat words carefully as you use them, as things which can destroy or bring life. Because you will be affected. And given words are so powerful, it's wise, it is life-giving for us and others to use them, Proverbs says, carefully, in a restrained way. There are lots of warnings about using words wrongly. Look at these two verses. Those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Or Proverbs 17, the one who has knowledge uses words with restraint and whoever has understanding is even tempered. Even fools, even stupid people are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. Just talking, 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 whatever's in your head will get you into trouble in this world. That's true in so many ways, isn't it? We've all seen the TV drama where the huge secret is let out as someone just gabbles on about nothing but also situations where you have power over other people, as a parent, as a boss, as a colleague, as a friend, you can just think you're expressing yourself, but your words can really affect others. I guess that's what my head teacher thought he was doing, just a daily part of his job, go into this classroom and tell this boy to work harder, but it stayed with me and affected me for a long time. You've probably been in a situation where you were feeling bad-tempered or you were chatting about something you didn't really know anything about or you were just speaking off the top of your head but your words ruined a friendship or hurt somebody. They broke a relationship. They affected your marriage. Nor is this more true than in the whole area of social media. This, you know, social media is this writ large that uh, not guarding your words can ruin your life. Solomon couldn't have imagined, I'd have thought, the whole phenomenon of social media, but it shows us this wisdom is timeless because people are there, aren't they, battering away at their keyboards full of anger or fear or hurt, as if they're just in a normal conversation, which 
in which words are powerful enough. But it's not just a normal conversation. Those things are there in black and white and put out into the whole world to see. And there's a record of them somewhere, no matter what you delete. And people are discovering in our culture now, aren't they, that those rash words on social media come back to ruin them later. So the wise person uses words with restraint. That is, thinks carefully and only says what really needs to be said. For that reason, Solomon says, silence is sometimes better. Of course, there are times that words have to be spoken so that truth can come out, so relationships can be built. We're going to see more on that in a minute. But often when you think you feel you need to say something, silence will be better. Particularly, the writer says, if you're going to say something in anger, if you are not even tempered at this moment in time, the wise thing to do is to restrain yourself and say nothing until you're even tempered. There's immense wisdom there, isn't there? Just think about that. There may be someone in your life you have sort of some ongoing like beef with. You feel annoyed with them generally about something. You feel irritated with them or scared of them. Maybe you've had to confront them about something and there's still tension there about that. Maybe something bad's happened in the past and it's never quite been resolved. But there's ongoing issues there. You should consider very carefully what you say to that person in that context when you're not even tempered. You should consider very carefully how you speak about that person when you're not with them. Because your words could come out wrong and do great damage. It's likely to be wiser to say nothing at all. I'm sure you've been in situations where you're navigating something that's quite relationally complicated and someone just snaps and lets rip. It would have been wise to stay quiet. Uh, you let your anger build up and, oh, I just needed to let it all out and let you know how I feel. Or I just needed to go off and moan to someone else about this person because they were driving me so mad. How often have you done that and it's overheard or gossiped about? It gets back and does the damage in the end. If you're not in an even temper, silence is usually wiser. Now we are for truth telling, we are for justice, we are for uncovering wrong behaviour, just to be clear. But even then, you will do that better if you have an even temper. So I would suggest if something really bad is happening that needs to be disclosed, you disclose it, but you get help from a trusted small group of counsellors first to help you even your temper out so that your words have the effect that they should. Rash, angry words about a serious thing are likely to make a situation worse and maybe even undermine the truth. You do need to speak truth, but restrain yourself until the words you speak will actually help. I love this little nugget from chapter 20 of Proverbs. It is a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later to consider one's vows. This is talking about misusing words spiritually. People who make big spiritual commitments, that's what that word dedicate means. It means to give something to God. So people who make big spiritual commitments, but they're not really ready to keep them. This is generally, in my experience, and you know, I'm not stereotyping, it's just an observation, more true of men than women. Men spiritually tend to be blaggers. Yeah, 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 I'm a really great on fire Christian. I contribute really, you know, erudite, thoughtful, theological things to the Bible study. But saying something to God, taking a spiritual persona is a serious thing. You will make a huge mess if you paint yourself into the corner by making yourself look more godly than you actually are with your words. You will trap yourself. There have been huge messes we've all experienced, I guess, when someone's words about their faith were far ahead and different from what they were actually willing to put into practice. 
you've probably been there, you know, the Christian leader or the passionate worshipper, all expressions of spiritual maturity, but they're just harsh with uncommitted people or they're not willing to actually do the hard thing in their own life when that opportunity comes. We don't want actually in our church family, certainly, a Christian culture that sets that trap. Nobody should feel pressured in our church to sort of pretend that they're a better Christian than they are. No, we talk owning our sin and asking for each other's help in turning to God, not constantly talking professions of how much we're going to do. So use your words with care. Can I say that's particularly true in any situation where you are the one with power or influence? You know, think carefully about how your words are forming your children. Think carefully about how the way you're speaking about people looks like to other people who work for you. Really consider carefully any time you have power over others, the, the damage your words could be doing. Of course, I'm talking here as if everybody is like me, a sort of verbal processor can't shut them up. There are, of course, some people who never speak at all. They're very happy not to speak. Maybe it's that they assume they shouldn't speak because they don't have anything good to say. Or it's because they have a life to hide. They don't want to speak because they don't want to be honest. Or, in fact, it can be that we're just lazy. It's easier at the end of church to go straight home without speaking to anybody. It's easier to come to my small group and just sit in silence. In fact, it's easier not to belong to any group at all where I'll be required to speak words. Well, words are powerful, so use, not using them is better than using them badly. But it may be that if you prefer silence, Proverbs says, you're missing out on the good that can be done with words. Real good, real life, real blessing can be brought to the world through people using words well. Proverbs says that lots of times. Look at this. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Or this one. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. You know, people come to church or to your connect group, or even just to you as a Christian, where you are day by day, people come to those conversations often sick from the world. You know, as I get older, as I live in the world day by day, I'm amazed at what I discover people are carrying. And people come into an environment like, you know, this, not quite this, because you're at home, but into a spiritual environment, a church or a Bible study or a discussion with a Christian, their guard is often down because they really come needing help with their spiritual sickness. And a reckless word there, a thoughtless word there, can pierce like a sword, someone who's already vulnerable. But the tool we have to bring healing and help to people who are sick from the word, world are the words that we can say to them. So spotting off all the time is a problem. Just saying what you think, using it as a chance to get things off your chest. You can crush people. But silence is also a wasted opportunity. You will know it's often been in your own life the considered, gentle, caring words of a Christian near you that have brought healing when you're sick from the world. Ah, but you say, it's the tongue of the wise that brings healing, and I'm not wise, so better to be quiet. Well, fair enough. If you really think you've got nothing good to say, don't fill the air with words that are not going to be so good. But just remember, the call of Proverbs is to live in the fear of the Lord, to walk through God's world so that you can gain wisdom, so you can say good words that you need to. So stop settling for just saying, I'm quiet because I'm stupid and don't have anything to say. The fear of the Lord and walking through God's world to learn wisdom, the offer is there to everyone who knows the covenant God who loves them. And then you can become a person whose words heal and bring life. 
Anxiety, Solomon says, weighs down the heart. Isn't that true? Anxiety is a huge problem for us generally, and I think especially at this moment. You're not going to solve someone's anxiety problem. That's not, you know, a, it's above your pay grade, most of us. Anxiety is a problem that needs often medical treatment or is deep-rooted in huge issues we can't undo for people. But we can all be kind. And kind words don't solve when someone's struggling with anxiety, but they really do help. Now you can say, well, I'm not the type of person who says good words. I prefer to be quiet. But someone who needs that cheering of the heart is missing out because you're choosing to not be kind. There's an anxious person who needs a kind word. And you might be wasting the opportunity to give that. The soothing tongue, says Solomon, is a tree of life. But a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. I love that because it's saying words can plant life. Now, I just want to say two things about that by way of application. The first one is this. This is actually quite different from what we're taught to think. So I think we're all aware of the power of words because we've experienced it, either positively or negatively, and a bit of both. In our world, we are taught that you use words for you, for your self-expression. The purpose of speaking is to help me get something that I need to say out there. You know, I would speak so I feel better, or I would speak so I make my mark on the world. This is my story, and it must be heard. I think that most often comes out uh, in a day-to-day level, certainly for me, for being like, oh, well, this might be a bit cruel, but it's funny. You know, words are for me, so you will laugh at my jokes. My self-expression is a beautiful and good thing. But in the emphasis of Proverbs, that's not mentioned. Words are powerful and they affect others. So the main way we should think about them is what effect will they have in the people around me, not do what do I feel the need to say. And that's natural, isn't it? If you fear the Lord, the kind God who makes promises, who uses his words for the good of us. If we worship him, we'll become people who uh, use our words to speak life to others. So be really clear. Proverbs says, how your words help others is much more important than using words so you feel better. Again, we're not saying injustices should be hidden. We're just saying carefully use your words so injustices are revealed. Not so you get what you want. Just to say there, I think there probably is a space where people are having actual talking therapies, where that's set up so the words are there to be therapeutic to you. But generally we think, because I feel this way, I must say it. And Proverbs just says a different emphasis. Worship God and use your words to bring life to others. And so what comes out of your mouth, the main consideration should be not what I feel or want to say, but what is this going to bring to the people who are hearing them? Second thing, just by way of application, what has this got to do with fear of the Lord? Well, you know the reason we worship God, the reason we give him that place of honour and reverence is not because we're ordered to, simply. You know, he's not, um, he's not a, a North Korean dictator who says, you all must worship me or I will kill you. The reason we are moved to worship God is because he's so praiseworthy. We sing to him when we're allowed to sing because we've got something amazing to sing about. Now, what is praiseworthy about God? Well, at least one of the things is the way he uses words. He uses his words to save us. He uses his words to comfort other people. He uses his words to condemn what's wrong, always in the hope of bringing repentance. God never snaps. He never uses his words selfishly. 
he's the one actually who has every right to self-express because it's his universe. But when his words became a person, Jesus, the living word, he did that to seek and save and serve others. That's why we love him. That's why we worship God, because he's like that. Why we reverence him, why we're drawn to him, because that's what he's like. We worship a God who's like that because he's so good. And one of the ways he's good is that's the way he uses words for others. Well, if the beginning of wisdom is to to set Jesus as Lord, to honour him, to worship him, to love him, the one who spoke wise, careful words to bring injustice to light and comfort the hurting, if you worship him and you think that's praiseworthy, you will be formed to and want to use words like that. Worship, honouring, fearing God is formative of us. We learn how to do that by walking through the world, but we start by admiring a God who's like that, and then we become a bit like that too. Another more, I guess, intimate way, the fear of the Lord helps us. I remember when I was at university, uh, I had a very irritating course mate, and everybody found him irritating, so when he wasn't there, the whole group of people who are on this particular module used to criticise him. And I remember saying to my church worker, um, oh, I think you just have to do that, even though gossip isn't good. Uh, You know, you have to find a way to let off steam with everybody else. And he said to me, well, the others in your group need someone to let off steam to, but you have someone to let off steam to, don't you? You have the creator of the universe to let off your steam to. The Psalms, which are prayers in the Bible, are full of complaints brought to the Lord. That's something God called, the relationship God calls us into, the covenant God. Better than mouthing off to your friends who can't help, that's usually just about being self-righteous, making yourself feel better. We take our troubles to the Lord. You know, if you have a big problem with restraining your words, probably is because you've never grown or lived or dwelt in that place the Bible shows us of bringing our complaints to the Lord. That doesn't silence the good words we need to do of bringing justice or being kind. But if we take it to the Lord, grow that fear of the promising God, we, we get our complaints out to him that actually forms us to be able to use our words for good. So words have power, so speak carefully. Much more briefly, words have power, so listen carefully. Proverbs has lots to say about this. Chapter 12, verse 1 says it's much more strongly than I would dare to. It says this, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. It's pretty blunt. Discipline here isn't self-discipline. It's not uh, like going for a run or whatever. It's the corrective discipline of someone you trust. Proverbs has lots to say about who that person should be. It says, don't listen to anybody if their character is rubbish. No matter what their position is, don't listen to them if their character is poor. But if there are people close to you who live a righteous life, who live wisely in the world that you think of as spiritual guides and leaders, who's live, who are living the Christian life in a way that you do respect, you should love being corrected by them. And if you hate being corrected by that person, you are stupid. Well, here's a confession. I hate being corrected, no matter who's doing it, so I am really stupid. I hate being corrected, even by really great people who I know have lots to teach me and who love me and care for me. How stupid! In fact, the proverb says more than, you know, just don't hate it. It says, seek it out. Love it. If there's someone in your life you respect in that way, who walks wisely, actually invite their discipline, their correction. Invite them to point out the negative things about you. Now, in a sense, it's sort of obvious that's true, isn't it? 
If people I admire and respect are on me, why would I not want their opinion? But I don't. And why don't I? Because, I'll tell you why for me, because I fear people more than I fear God. I want to reverence them and their opinion of me much more than I want to fear God and live in a life-giving way. But it actually it's one of the great things about being a Christian when we can put it into practice. If we fear God and honour him, only his opinion matters. And if you've trusted Jesus, his opinion of you is set. You are accepted and justified and adopted and forgiven. That frees you to not fear or be angry about people who care about you giving you discipline and correction. It's shocking to me about myself, and I think about all of us, to be honest, in our culture, how much we run from wisdom in this way. You know, if someone dares to say anything corrective to us, even if they are a really good person to do that, we are angry. And Proverbs says it's not just that you should not be angry. That's stupid. You should love someone speaking to you in that way. Maybe a good takeaway from this sermon would be to find the person like that and ask them to give an honest opinion of where you're getting things wrong. Just as an aside, if you are asked to do that, you must be honest. Flattery Proverbs says, great picture, spreads a net at people's feet. If you are asked to give wisdom and discipline and all you say is, oh no, you're really nice, you're lovely, you're just setting up something that people will trip up over because they're bound to need help with something and you're not giving them that chance. You're setting them up to fail. Listen, we are in the process of re-emerging into the world. We're going to talk across the desk again. We're going to have chances to socialise again. We're going to be able to go to the pub. We're going to be able to see our connect group in person. As we do that, let's remember what Proverbs says. Words have power. And we have a chance a chance to use our words to be life-giving people, to bring good to the world. That is much better than the sort of feeble, pathetic aim of wanting to express ourselves. But here's a great way about the fear of the Lord works here, because as I think about this whole thing to do with words, I just become convicted about how unwise I've been, how badly I've used my words. And the Bible says, well, the thing to do when you realise that is to come to God and confess. And when you do that with the covenant God, the Lord, you'll find him welcoming you because of the death of his son. And so your heart is called out further as you bring your sin to him in fear, in growth of adoration and worship and love of him. And then what does that do? That then shapes your words. And you go into the world and you live trying to use your words well and you'll probably fail again so you'll come back and confess to God, discover his love for you in Jesus and your adoration of him grows. It's all set up very well that we go into the world to learn, we get it wrong and the result of getting it wrong is to grow in our fear of the Lord which will give us better words. So if you feel like that today, bring your lack of wisdom to Jesus Allow God's Son to take his glorious place in the centre of your life. That's the beginning of wisdom. And then we have a chance, a chance to speak words that do good in this world that is ever so broken. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, so much that you give us this power to influence the world. How we pray that you will make our hearts right with you so that the words we speak do good. Put in our lives, Lord, people who are anxious and need a kind word. Put in our lives, Heavenly Father, people who are sick and need healing words. And then let, give us the, the pleasure and the joy of speaking those words and help us know the words to say because we have such fear and reverence for you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.